friends, my name is Willow and I am always wondering why. I'm sure you are too. I'm here to talk about all things true crime. I will discuss a case and hopefully get your thoughts on it because I'm always a curious little one as I'm sure you are too. Disclaimer, the following presentation is for mature audiences. It contains graphic description of crime scenes, adult dialogue, and strong language. Viewer discretion is advised. A cold night with two parents brutally attacked. A home turned into a bloodbath filled with defaced bodies. The sight the first responders met when they arrived at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Porco was definitely not something anyone could have ever anticipated. On the 15th of November 2004, investigators were faced with a grisly and confusing crime scene. It was the murder scene of Peter Porco and the attempted murder of his wife Joan Porco. 52 years old, Peter Porco was a happily married father of two. He worked as a clerk for an appeal court judge. He was married to Joan Porco. She was a children's speech pathologist. They were both like every other normal middle-aged, middle-class American, and they lived comfortably. They resided in Delma, New York. Peter Porco was well respected for his diligence and dedication to his job. He was a cheerful man and was well disciplined in respect of who was involved in any situation that required sincerity and equality. On Monday the 15th of November 2004, Peter was absent from work, which was quite odd. Peter wasn't one to be absent from work without substantial reason. Peter's diligence and his standard of always showing up would be what would in fact save his wife's life. So just in case you're being a couch potato, you might want to start keeping those appointments and showing up for work diligently. It might just one day save your life. His co-worker Michael Hart went ahead to Peter's residence after calls put through to Peter's phone from the office got no response. Michael Hart met the door slightly ajar the key still in the lock, then he sighted drops of blood at the entrance. Michael went into a state of fear and confusion and refused to go any further and hurriedly placed a phone call to the police. 911, what's the location of the emergency? Broccoli Drive, Delmar, New York. Okay. Broccoli? Yes. Yeah, what's the problem? There's a, a 55-year-old white male down on the ground. We have a court officer on the scene. 55-year-old male? Yes, an armed court officer on the scene. He's on the scene? Yes. Okay. The guy did not show up for work today. He's, he's, he's unresponsive? He's unresponsive. He's unresponsive, but he's on the line. What do you mean he's on the line? Well, my boss is speaking to him on the cell phone right now. Okay. Got to... Okay. Okay, There's, you, you don't know, you, he's unresponsive, you, you don't know if there's any breathing, anything, do you? Checking his pulse right now, we're trying to see if there's a pulse. Okay, keep with me on that. It's a crime scene. It's a crime scene? It's a crime scene, what I'm being told by the officer on the scene. Okay, and what, why, why is that? Uh, there's blood down on the ground, and he's not breathing, we need... Yeah, yeah okay, okay. Um, okay, we're on our way. Okay. Okay. You want me to stay on line? Uh, this third party call, really not, okay? Okay. Okay? Yep. Peter Porco was found dead at the bottom of the stairs from massive head injuries. Upstairs, Joan Porco was still alive, but had her life hanging by a tiny little thread of hope. Her face had been disfigured, her jaw caved in, one of her eyes had been removed, her forehead was completely severed. It was such a fearful and grisly sight for the paramedics that it 
had arrived. It was so terrible, they encountered difficulty in administering the oxygen mask to Joan as they were unable to detect where her mouth was to put the mask. A three foot fireman's ax was discovered right there in their bedroom. From forensic evidence, it was discovered that the attack had taken place upstairs. So how computer's body was found downstairs? Apparently, after being irreparably axed, Peter had come to, in what appeared to be a trance-like state, had surprisingly gotten out of his bed, went about his daily routine, he dressed himself, prepared a bowl of cereal, he even tried shaving while part of his jaw was missing. He further walked downstairs and even went outside to get the morning paper. It was weird how that was possible. It was as creepy as it was in the zombie movies. Peter Porco was preparing for work in his trance-like state, dying. The investigators could only assume the series of events that had taken place in the early hours of the morning, as no neighbors were able to see how hurt Peter Porco was. However, forensic experts have been able to explain the zombified state of Peter Porco. It was due by the damage sustained by the outer layer of the brain, the neocortex. The neocortex is responsible for comprehensive reasoning and complex thoughts, language as well as sensory perception, and it also makes up for 76% of the volume of our human brain. While the paleocortex, which is less stratified than the neocortex, is responsible for the phenomenon of consciousness, primal instincts, as well as routine habits, However, Peter Porco's neocortex was badly damaged, while the paleocortex, which was not completely damaged and still in a reasonable state, took over, hence explaining this strange event of Peter's actions after the attack. Meanwhile, these tasks weren't done with etiquette. He would be shaking, pouring his cereal, and putting the dishes back, but leaving blood everywhere. After Peter left the house to get the morning paper, the front door had swung closed behind him. So he grabbed a spare key that was in the flower pot in his front yard, and he was able to get back into his apartment. The brain is absolutely incredible. Unfortunately, his trance-like state didn't last for long either. He lost conscious immediately, fell lifelessly to the ground, and bled out at the foot of the stairs. Peter Porco had been attacked and struck 10 to 30 times in the head with a three-foot fire axe act that, axe that was found in their bedroom which resulted in Peter bleeding out profusely. Jonathan Porco, 23, at the time of the attack, was serving in the U.S. Navy on the nuclear submarine and hadn't set eyes on his parents for months, which made it clearly impossible for him to have been around at the time of the incident. He was the first son of the couple. However, Christopher Porco, 21, the quiet, innocent looking, charming, popular young lad, studied at the University of Rochester, which was only a few hours drive away from their home. He was the second son of Peter and Joan Porco. Christopher Porco claimed that he learned about the attack on his parents from a reporter. Please suspect your sagging, Hi, uh, my name is Chris Porco. I was just called by the Times Union saying that my parents were found dead this afternoon. Um, I was wondering if you had any information on me. Hey, Chris, from, what about uh, Saria? I'm at school in Rochester, New York. Okay, are, are, are you in a dorm there? Yes, I am. Okay. 
Do you have a dorm name or? Um, it's called Monroe. Okay. And you were hearing from the Times Union? Yeah, they called me and said my, my parents were found, um, I guess, I don't know, they didn't say how or anything. Let me try and find you somebody who may have some more information for you. Okay. Uh, now, as far as, when was the last time you said you came down and saw your parents? Uh, about three weeks ago. I, it was on a weekend. I can't give you a day. I have to, I have to figure it out. I'm not really sure. Okay, but about three weeks ago? Yeah. Okay, and the email, what, what's going on with your email? You said you, um, you, well, you emailed him today, but you didn't get a, a response? Well, yeah, I, I emailed him this afternoon. Um, I got at work. Okay. Uh, about uh, college loan stuff. Okay. You're going to go right to Albany Med? I, I don't know. I don't even know where my mom is. but. Yeah, she is at Albany Med. Okay. Do, do you know her condition? Uh, in... No, because I haven't talked to her. Let me give you my pager number. Okay. Because uh, when you get there, I'll come and see if there's anything I can do for you. Okay. All right? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Okay. Right, between both his sons, Christopher had been the rebellious kid and got into a lot of trouble growing up. On the 28th of November, 2002, Christopher Porco had burgled his parents' house. He stole two laptops and a camera. Also on the 23rd of July, 2003, he broke in and stole a Macintosh laptop and a Dell laptop. He had stolen quite expensive things from his parents' house on both occasions. One of such cameras was recovered from the front yard of Mr. Porco and Joan's residence. Peter and Jonathan Porco had their eBay accounts frozen one month before the attack since they shared the same Del Mar address. This was because Christopher Porco had defrauded a lot of customers who never got the items they paid for. As investigations got deeper, they discovered that Christopher had impersonated his brother, Jonathan, falsely claiming that his brother had died and as a result was unable to deliver the items that were already paid for. The Bethlehem detectives had once traveled to San Diego, California to retrieve a laptop that Christopher Porco had stolen from his parents' house and sold on eBay. Christopher had also worked at a veterinary clinic. The clinic got burgled and items such as phones, cameras, and laptops had gone missing. How many laptops does this guy need? Christopher's relationship with his parents had gone a bit sour as he took part in a lot of heinous, fraudulent, and deceptive acts. He had also convinced his college friends that he was from a wealthy family. In an email Peter wrote to Chris, he wrote, Dishonesty is crumbling our relationship with you. However, no words or counsel to Christopher Porco held water for him. Christopher was the fun-loving type. He loved to hang out with his friends and planned holidays that he would bankroll with the money he had gotten illegally. Seriously, bankrolling trips and holidays? Wow. I thought everyone agreed that college students were broke. Where's the need to act like you have money that you actually don't have? It's college. Everybody's broke. Well, Jonathan Porco was able to clear out any suspicions of him being the culprit of his parents' attack, it wasn't so easy for the younger Christopher to prove his innocence. Jonathan Porco revealed during the trial that the relationship he had had with his brother Christopher was strained. Christopher, who was already implicated as a result of his crimes of fraud and stealing, was further implicated when items from the veterinary clinic he had worked at were all found in his cupboard at the time of the investigation of his parents' attack. It was discovered that Chris Porco had also forged his transcripts to Rochester University from Hudson Community College after his previous dropout from Rochester University 
as a result of bad grades. He had gone to the community college in an effort to straighten out his grades and instead forged the transcript. His dropping out had caused a great deal of misunderstanding between him and his parents earlier in the fall. He lied to his parents saying that the University of Rochester was taking care of his tuition because a professor had misplaced his final exam scripts from the previous semester. Meanwhile, Chris had pla planned to pay his fall tuition fees with the money he acquired from a loan fraudulently. My mouth is literally hanging open at this point, and it doesn't get any better. Chris, out of his many fraudulent acts included getting his father's personal and tax information, forgery of Peter Porco's signature, even going as far as taking out a high interest loan to buy a yellow Jeep Wrangler and bankrolling an exotic holiday during spring break for him and his friends in Europe. While away on this trip, Chris's first parents became aware of their son's failing grades at Hudson Valley Community College. In an email to Chris, they wrote, You just left, and we can't believe our eyes as we look at your interim grade, grade report. You know what they say, three strikes and you're out? Explain yourself. The subject header of the email read, Failing Grades, You Did It Again. A few days later, Christopher wrote back to his parents, as usual, with nothing but a plot of deceit and outright manipulation. His email read thus, But they are incorrect. My lowest grade I got on anything was a B on a physics test. Don't jump to conclusions. I'm fine having fun in Europe, on your dime. Fast forward to November 2004. Peter discovered the forged signatures for the loan that had been carried out by his son Chris. Two weeks before his murder, he sent an email to Chris. Did you forge my signature as a co-signer? What the hell are you doing? You should have called me to discuss this. I'm calling Citibank this morning to find out what you have done and I'm going to tell them I am not going to be on it as a co-signer. The following day, Peter Porco got notifications that his son Chris had obtained a line of credit from Citibank to finance the Jeep Wrangler which was in Chris's possession and also impersonating his father's name as a co-signatory. And already frustrated, Peter Porco immediately threatened legal actions against his son. Still assuring Chris of the love he and Joan had for him. I want you to know if you abuse my credit again, I will be forced to file affidavits to disclaim liability. And that applies to the Citibank college loan. If you attempt to reactivate it, or use my credit to obtain any other loan. We may be disappointed with you, son, but your mother and I still love you and care about your future. This was a loving family. These were some parents people would beg to have. All this stood as evidence against Christopher Porco, supporting the fact that he could be the mastermind behind his parents' gruesome assault and attack. The investigators believe that Christopher Porco, beneath his innocent, perfect facade, was nothing but a solid sociopath who would stop at nothing to keep his lies and deceit swept under a carpet. A certain professor had argued that the investigators' questioning procedures were almost completely flawed as they failed to give a detailed account of P Christopher Porco's probable behavior disorder. 
Although there were also a few possible suspects that could have been responsible for the attack. The defense counsel at the trial stated that Peter Porco at the time of the attack had a relative that was apprehended in federal prison as a result of his involvement in mob-related crimes. He was known as Frankie the Fireman, hence the Fireman's Axe. He, he was the captain in the Banano crime family in New York. He was serving two years in prison for loan sharking and extortion. It was assumed that the axe found in the couple's bedroom belonged to him since it was a fireman's axe. Investigators sought out and implied the possibility of the attack being a message from another mob member to Frankie so as not to snitch or betray the gang. Hence the investigators went to question Frankie whose statements had no other incriminating information that could implicate him further in the attack of his relative, Peter Porco. Hence, investigators ruled out Frankie as a primary suspect. Another suspect was a disgruntled fellow who had lost custody of his child in a trial Peter Porco had been involved in. He had been sent death threats to Peter and was a key suspect in the attack of Peter Porco, but he had an alibi and so any suspicions of him being a possible suspect was completely ruled out. Further investigations pointed out that it was merely impossible these attacks were carried out without the help of a family member if not single-handedly carried out by a familiar personality to the family with damning evidence pointing at Christopher. The investigators of the Bethlehem Police Department who were in charge of the case concerning the attack were not ready to leave any table unturned or stones still rolling. They had gotten security footage from Rochester University which captured a yellow Jeep Wrangler leaving the university campus at exactly 10.30 p.m. on the night which Christopher's parents had been brutally attacked and also him returning to the campus at 8.30 a.m. the next morning, which was basically enough time for such an attack to have been carried out and covered up in the most desperate means. Meanwhile, Christopher told the investigators that on that night of the attack, he went to a dormitory lounge to sleep and remain there till the next morning. However, a New York State Thruway toll collector outside the Rochester Camp University campus claimed to have sighted a yellow Jeep Wrangler with large tires pass through his station on the night of the attack, the 14th of November. Christopher Porco could be seen as or considered anything at all but dangerous was one thing that would have not made the list. This led to investigators searching for Chris's Jeep where they had found some things not so normal and uncoordinated. Chris's Easy Pass, an electronic toll collection system used on toll roads, especially in the Midwestern and Eastern states in the US, had been kept away from the interior windshield which is set to automatically pay for its toll. It was tucked beneath one of the seats which enabled Chris to pay cash at the toll without any detection. The security footage at the toll booth however was able to capture Chris's Jeep clearly but failed to capture exactly who was driving. However, without a doubt, it was Christopher Porco's Jeep. This gave the investigators a clue on the time he arrived and what booth he had gone through. Luckily, the investigators were able to detect a ticket that had Christopher's DNA. 
Peter's home had its security system deactivated by someone who clearly had an insight on its master code and the phone lines were also deliberately cut. These further threw an investigators into a circle of evidence pointing to a family member further incriminating Christopher Porco as the perpetrator of the attack. Since Jonathan clear was clearly not available and the master code could only be assessed by members of the family, this supported the suspicion that Christopher was the culprit. Amazingly, amazingly, Joan Porco was still alive though she was barely conscious and soaked in blood. A detective who happened to be a close family friend, Christopher Bodish, was in total disbelief of this crime scene before his eyes. He took note of the scenario and having discovered that there was no forced entry into the apartment, he thought he had a feeling of what was truly going on. He stated the apartment was still neat and all its contents were undisturbed. He stated the house was what wasn't what we call tossed. The drawers weren't pulled out they weren't dumped and he made mentions of Joan's purse which was still on the dining table still completely intact making it highly unlikely that it was a robbery or something of that sort instead making it obvious that the intruder had come in only with the motive of murdering Peter and Joan who could possibly have had a mur motive to do that they had been married for 30 years, living in a bedroom community just outside of Albany. So what exactly could have been the motive, Detective Bodish thought. Seeing Mrs. Joan Porco still conscious, he approached her hoping to get a headway that could probably lead them closer to their answers faster and he asked if Jonathan was responsible for the attacks to which Joan lifelessly shook her head in a seemingly no manner. He went further and asked if Christopher was responsible for the attacks and she nodded in a yes manner. She was also asked other questions which she responded to the same manner. This shocked the paramedic team that was standing in the room at the time Detective Bodish placed his questions. First responders Kevin Robert, Jim Regan, and Dennis Wood couldn't believe their eyes as they had never seen anybody with such massive facial and head trauma still be alive and able to respond as Mrs. Joan Porco did at that point. Afterward, she was taken to the hospital by the paramedics. Detective Christopher Bodish was disgusted and flabbergasted at the effrontery of Christopher Porco to take such action on his parents. Late November 2004, the outgoing Albany County District Attorney Paul Klein was able to solicit for a grand jury to hear and examine information incriminating Christopher Porco in the murder of his father Peter and the attempted murder of his mother Joan. Witnesses included Chris's friends from college, one of the university campus safety officers and a former girlfriend. They had their testimonies in a closed session hearing a neighbor of the Porcos had testified at the trial that he had sighted Chris's yellow Jeep Wrangler parked outside the night the attack had, had taken place. Students from the university campus also testified that Christopher was not seen sleeping in a dormitory lodge on the night of the attack. Jonathan Porco's testimony had also impacted the case greatly as his demeanor towards his brother was icy. With enough evidence 
incriminating Christopher Porco, the investigators were convinced that he had, without a doubt, carried out the gruesome attacks. However, that they were unable to prove that he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. There was no physical evidence that Christopher had indeed used the three-foot fireman axe to attack his parents. The police had earlier seized a large number of his clothing as well as his Jeep. However, there were no traces of blood. Also, no fingerprints were recovered from the fireman's axe that was found in the couple's bedroom on the night of the attack. Nor were there any traces of blood found in his car. John Kearney, Chris's employer at the vet clinic, testified in court that Christopher had an experience in cleaning up after animal surgeries and taking care of what he termed bloody and messy which could have implied that Christopher could possibly have carried out the crime and cleaned up neatly so as to leave no trails of evidence on him. It however made sense and the boxes of latex gloves and kitchen bin bags that were found by the investigators in the cabinet of Peter and Joan's residence caught the attention of the jury. The prosecutor was able to establish that, indeed, Christopher Porco was a serial cheater that took advantage of his parents and elder brother's patients to mask as a lavish spender through Judge Barry, refused to allow the prosecutors to use the forged transcripts against Christopher Porco as evidence in the case. However, Joan had fully regained consciousness at the time of the trial, but had suffered amnesia about the entire attack. She testified in court that she had no idea what happened and she was certain that Christopher had no hand in the attack she and her husband Peter had suffered, further leading the frustrations of the investigators. She solidly defended her son and attested to his innocence and that he wasn't capable of committing such a heinous offense. She stated that in as much as he got involved in a lot of deceitful and fraudulent acts, murder was something her son Christopher was not capable of. It was unclear if Joan was simply trying to cover up for her son to protect him from the consequences of his deeds, or if she was trying to protect herself by not accepting the reality of her son's actions. There is a possibility that it was a psychological protection measure by her brain by blocking the entire event subconsciously. Similar to Peter's encounter, these events critically denounce how amazing the human brain is. She then stated that in the past month prior to the attack, she had seen a stranger one time in, at the garden and another night at their driveway, which she found suspicious and was convinced had something to do with the attack she and her husband had faced. However, these statements made no sense to the jury. It was as amusing as it was disturbing that Joan's brain sim seemed to have mysteriously created this person in the garden and the driveway as just a mechanism for things to make sense to her. Heather Martin, the second juror in charge of the case, stated the jury was in complete consensus that somewhere there is a container or bag containing clothing, shoes, and quite possibly a small paring knife or small scissors. On the 10th of August 2006, the jury began deliberations. Christopher Porco was found guilty of second-degree murder of his father, Peter Porco, 
and was also found guilty for the attempted murder of his mother, Joan Porco. On the 12th of December, 2006, Christopher Porco was sentenced to 50 years in prison for each count, totaling a minimum of 50 years in prison, and would only be allowed for parole by 2052. Judge Jeffrey Berry at the sentencing had highlighted his fears of such an event taking place again. I fear very much what happened in the early morning hours of November 15th is something that could happen again. The vicious axe attack had shocked the entire Del Mar neighborhood. A lot of Del Mar residents and Peter Porco's neighbors were hesitant to believe that Christopher Porco could do anything, and many still believe that the prosecution was rushed and that the jury could have possibly convicted the innocent young lad Christopher Porco. This is an amazing and even scary story of the undying love of parents, even in the face of such horror. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that like button so I can keep making these videos. Check out my other videos and never stop wondering. Stay safe and stay happy. Always yours. Love Willow.